The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. And it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Yeah! From the promise of legalization. To the agony of prohibition. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rough Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. I hear you, you had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. We love it. All right, good day, tokers and tokens, and welcome. It is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2013, and it's got to be 420, somewhere in the world. And yes, we pushed record for today's show. Big apologies for yesterday's show that did not get recorded. So sad about that, but uh, my mind was elsewhere. All fixed now. This show will be recorded and replayed and podcast. And speaking of podcast, I get to announce a brand new podcast, uh, a new feed, I should say. It's not a new show or anything, but our 420 Radio News, our six-minute segment of the 420 Radio News, is now a podcast. You'll be able to download just the news headlines for your iPod or other media player, as well as being able to pick up the video on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Radical Rust. Just another way to get the headlines out there, get the information out there for the folks uh, who may not have time to listen to the whole show. So check it out. On today's show, we've got our live questions and answers with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. He writes the Ask Dr. Mitch column in High Times Magazine, and you get a chance to call in live at 971-533-7111. Ask your cannabis science, culture, history, and health questions from Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Or you can get into our chat room here at Ustream. Just type slash login and you can create yourself an account. And uh, we'll take your live questions. There's also three studies uh, that have piled up over the uh, past couple of weeks that I want to talk to Dr. Mitch about. uh, Having to do with diabetes, mental health, and body fat for pot smokers. Uh, Something I need to worry about. All three of those things, I guess. So <laughs> this will be a good conversation. Also, we've got a rebook from yesterday. We were unable to get a hold of Tracy Ansley from Moms for Marijuana in Texas. We've got her number today. We'll be able to get her on the line. We'll talk to her about being a mother in Texas and how hard it is to be a marijuana activist uh, while being a mom. Also, great news in our 420 Radio News headlines. Florida's Kathy Jordan will not be jailed. Actually, it was her husband who was facing jail for growing her medical marijuana plants. Uh, the DA has declined to pro- prosecute that we will get to in the headline news and we'll recover the headlines from yesterday as well in our behind the headline segment so at least when we start the uh, the new podcast it'll have two episodes to go with all that and more coming up on the russ bell bell show including we've got brian the red here with our irie wednesday daily toker tunes to get you ready for tonight's red eyes reggae flashback at 8 p.m pacific time Plenty of stuff going on at 420radio.org. Check our website for the schedules, the blogs, and all of the show archives. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. Hi, this is Dan Michaels. If you're looking for professional voice talent for your commercial or podcast, I'm your man. Visit DanMichaelsAudio.com for more information. (laughs) 
Now it's time for your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, April 2nd, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. State law reduces marijuana penalties from the BrownDailyHerald.com. A law decriminalizing marijuana in Rhode Island went into effect yesterday. Under the new law, individuals caught in possession of less than one ounce of marijuana will face a civil fine of $150 instead of the criminal charges possible under the previous laws. If an individual is caught with the drug three times in 18 months, the original penalty of $500 and up to a year in prison still applies. 50% of revenue connect collected from the fines will help fund drug treatment and education programs. House panel will hear marijuana bill, this from the statesmanjournal.com. Forty years after the possession of small amounts was decriminalized, Oregon lawmakers will consider a bill to regulate the production, processing, and sale of marijuana. House Bill 3371, which will be heard by the House Judiciary Committee this afternoon, isn't likely to advance this session. But it could become the framework for a ballot initiative for the general election in November 2014. Under the bill, the Oregon Health Authority would license producers, processors, and wholesale and retail sellers of the drug, and the Oregon Liquor Control Commission would have the authority to tax marijuana. <laughs> marijuana THC driving bill continue, continues steady march to passage, this from westward.com. As Westward has reported, legislation to set THC driving standards in Colorado have failed twice before. However, a new version that also tweaks alcohol DUI rules won unanimous approval during its first House committee hearing in late February. Representative Rhonda Fields, a co-sponsor of the latest measure, said, quote, The reason this bill is different is because it has a permissible inference in it. The previous bill had a per se limit, end quote. To explain, the legislation from 2011 and 2012 would have established THC intoxication at 5 nanograms per milliliter of blood and made this standard per se, meaning that a test registering 5 nanograms or more would be seen as irrefutable proof of intoxication. But critics argued that because THC tends to linger in users for longer periods of time, it's next to impossible to determine actual impairment via a blood test, at least under currently available technology. This year, the 5 nanogram limit is still in place, but the per se language is gone, replaced by permissible inference, which would allow people who register at 5 nanograms or above to present other evidence to prove that they weren't actually impaired, rather than being considered guilty as a result of the test reading. Legal protections passed for medical marijuana caregivers, this from the Baltimore Sun. The General Assembly has passed a law that allows caregivers of patients who use medical marijuana to possess up to an ounce of pot without being convicted of a crime. Under the bill, caregivers as well as patients could still be charged with a crime for possessing the drug, but the legislation spells out how caregivers could prove themselves not guilty because they had the drug and paraphernalia to help a family member who takes it for medical reasons. The bill is among several laws being considered in Annapolis this session. The House, but not the Senate, has approved creating the state's first medical marijuana program. The Senate, but not the House, has approved a bill that makes possession of less than 10 grams of marijuana, roughly a third of an ounce, a civil offense instead of a criminal one. Another bill that would completely decriminalize marijuana, then regulate and tax it like alcohol, received a committee hearing in the House, but has not yet been voted on. Florida medical marijuana bill stalled while bongs ban advances. This from HuffingtonPost.com. 18 states in D.C. have passed medical marijuana legislation, but in Florida, the Kathy Jordan Medical Cannabis Act can't even get a hearing in the state, Senate, or House. The bill has stalled in Tallahassee, despite the fact that 7 out of 10 Floridians support legalizing medical marijuana. Meanwhile, a bill banning bongs was unanimously approved by a Senate committee. The Kathy Jordan Medical Cannabis Act is named for Kathy Jordan, who has been suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease since 1986. In February, the Manatee County Sheriff's Department staged an armed raid on the Jordan's home, seizing 23 marijuana plants, including two mature plants Kathy was using to treat her symptoms. Opponents like Representative Jimmy Petronas of Panama City think Kathy and other Floridians needing medical marijuana for medical reasons should move to a state where it's legal, reports the News Herald. Edwards told the News Herald she plans to file a compromised version of the same bill next year limiting medical cannabis use to oil, pill, or topical form to further distance it from recreational use. This has been your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, April 2nd, 2013.
I'm Russ Belleville. We'll be back with more of the Russ Belleville Show here on 420radio.org after these messages. org is listener-supported cannabis community radio, and while we value every $4.20 donation that comes in monthly from our members, we take this moment to offer an extra special thanks to our most generous donors, who have provided over $1,000 worth of support to 420radio.org. For their privacy's sake, we'll identify these knights and dames of the smoky table as... Sir Randy of the Lakes... Dame Kathleen the Beneficent. Dame Kaylee the Wise. Sir Travis of Stumptown. Sir Rolla J of Cush. And others who wish to remain anonymous. Thank you, lords and ladies, for your most generous patronage. The Russ Belleville Show. Chat is for friends 18 and older. We expect our chat to be civil, mature, and free from excessive profanity. If you don't like these rules, there are approximately 6 billion other chat rooms with lower standards that you can visit. It's time for your 420 Radio News for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. Prosecutors will not file charges against Robert Jordan, accused of growing marijuana. This from the HeraldTribune.com. Prosecutors declined Tuesday to press charges against Robert Jordan for cultivating marijuana plants, which he said were to treat his wife Kathy's illness. The state attorney's office announced that it believed Jordan could successfully mount a medical necessity defense in court. The Jordan's home was raided by Manatee County Sheriff's Office in February after a tip that there were two marijuana plants growing in their backyard. The Jordans have lobbied in Tallahassee for marijuana legalization for years, spending even more time talking with state lawmakers after the raid about the bill named for Kathy Jordan. Kathy Jordan, age 62, has used marijuana for years to control the symptoms of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. The president of the Florida Cannabis Action Network, Kathy Jordan, quote, does more in that wheelchair than most people do, end quote, her husband has said. Toking up at the bar under Washington state legal marijuana law? Not for long, say state officials. This from the StarTribune.com. Washington state officials say it's not okay for bars to allow marijuana use, and they'll take quick steps to address that. The announcement from the State Liquor Control Board on Wednesday followed a recent report by the Associated Press about establishments in Olympia and Tacoma that allow people to consume marijuana on site. Washington legalized pot for adults last fall, but public display and use of marijuana is barred under the law, punishable by a civil infraction carrying a $103 fine. The Liquor Control Board's rules allow it to punish bars that allow criminal activity on site, but not bars that allow civil infractions. And that's the loophole regulators intend to address. Board members say they're concerned about people mixing alcohol and marijuana, then getting behind the wheel. Will Oregon be the first state to legalize marijuana through the legislature? From theweedblog.com. At the Oregon legislature yesterday, House Bill 3371 became the first Oregon cannabis legalization measure to have a hearing and pass out of a committee. The bill passed out of the committee 6-3, to three, with one Republican, Wayne Krieger, joining the committee's five Democrats. The bill now moves on to the House Committee on Revenue. Under House Bill 3371, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, or OLCC, will license and regulate the state's marijuana industry. The bill allocates 40% of revenue for education, 20% for law enforcement, 
20% for the general fund, and 20% for mental health and substance abuse services. House Bill 3371 will also allow Oregon farmers to produce industrial hemp, a low-potency form of marijuana with many uses, such as paper, fiber, and textile products. Ending hemp prohibition will provide farmers with a sustainable, profitable new crop while creating jobs across multiple business sectors in Oregon. Czech pharmacies begin selling medical marijuana from rawstory.com. Medical marijuana legally went on sale Tuesday in pharmacies across the Czech Republic for patients suffering from cancer, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, or psoriasis. The prescription-only drug formally became legal on Monday. Prague will first import the drug for about a year, reportedly from Israel or the Netherlands, until the State Institute for Drug Control starts issuing licenses to local growers for a maximum of five years. People holding up to 15 grams or a little over a half an ounce of marijuana or growing up to five plants of cannabis risk just a small fine. A 2011 national report on narcotics said 16.1% of Czechs aged 15 to 34 admitted to having used marijuana in that year, down from 20.3% a year earlier. Fighting drug addiction with marijuana from ABC News. For decades, Colombia has been searching for ways to treat people who are addicted to basuco, the nation's version of crack cocaine. Now the country's capital, Bogota, is considering a new approach, transitioning users to marijuana. Basuco isn't the same as crack, but it's an apt comparison. Like crack, it's smokable and more common among a poorer segment of society. Julian Quintero from the Bogota-based nonprofit organization Acción Técnica Social, which works on drug policy, told BBC Mundo how such centers will work. First, you start reducing the dose. After that, you change administration. If you injected heroin, you move to smoking heroin, from smoking heroin to combining it with cannabis, and after that, staying with cannabis. Is anyone in the U.S. trying this sort of approach with hard drugs? Absolutely not. And that's your 420 Radio News for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. When we come back, we go behind the headlines and look at the closing or the attempt to close Frankie's and Stonegate in Washington State. You're listening to the Russ Bellville Show on 420radio.org. We'll be right back after this. All right, welcome back from our little uh, time loop there. No, you're not having deja vu. It's not the weed. Uh, we did do two new segments in a row because I missed the new segment yesterday. But I did really briefly want to do a quick behind the headlines on this attempt by the Washington State Liquor Control Board to punish Frankie's, the Stonegate, and these other bars that are allowing people to use marijuana. When I was there at Frankie's just a week ago and was talking to one of the managers there, I said, boy, it must be kind of nice here having all these pot smokers because they're so mellow, right? And he goes, yeah, but you know what's interesting is the beer drinkers have gotten more mellow, too. And this scare that there's going to be people drinking and combining you know, marijuana and alcohol, from what I saw up there, it was like an old junior high school lunchroom. The beer drinkers were over there, the cigarette smokers were over there, and the pot smokers were over here. And as far as people drinking and combining with marijuana, I've found in my personal experiences, having been to many, many events where both are common, that where marijuana is available, the use of alcohol drops. You can look at any of the cannabis cups or any of the hemp expos that actually do bother to have an alcohol bar or, or a beer garden or whatever, and they're almost always just barren. You know, very few people hanging out at the beer bar, lots of people back where they can get the, uh, the marijuana. So I don't see this as becoming a problem, unless, of course... You're relying on beer revenues, if you're getting uh, political donations from the distributors in your town, if anything having to do with selling more alcohol has to, uh, you know, pays your salary, then I can see where it might be a problem having people using marijuana. But this idea that the people of Washington legalized marijuana with I-502, yet didn't think adults should be able to be in the same room with each other using it, is ludicrous. All we are asking for is to be treated with the same equal rights as our beer drinking, our wine drinking, our whiskey, whiskey sipping friends. We just want equal rights. That's what this is about. And by gosh, we should 
be able to have our own places to gather and, and commune with each other, just like beer drinkers have. Whiskey sipping. I tried. Whipsy sipping. Skidding. I'll have another one after. Oh, oh, oh. That's why I don't drink. Exactly. <laughs> Not in public. <laughs> Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Uh, it's quite simple. I'm a very nasty drunk. I get mean. I get loud. I'll tell your deepest, darkest secrets to a stranger, and I'll puke on your shoes. So, um, if that's the kind of behavior that this culture promotes, you know, fuck it. Your one-room schoolhouse of choice. Your one-stop freedom shop. It's the Libra Lounge. Sundays at 3, right here. Since medical marijuana became legal in Colorado, Marisol Therapeutics has been one of the most successful dispensaries in the state. Caring for thousands of patients, Marisol produces terrific medicine in their greenhouses and in their outdoor gardens. Here's Michael Stetler, the director of Marisol Therapeutics. Uh, this is our grow. We handle probably over 1,500 patients. We're licensed by the state of Colorado, and we try to do things the proper way. Different patients need different uh, strains for different ailments. It's really hard for us to grow this medicine and have the federal government say this and, and people out there in the everyday life not understand what this medicine's about. God wouldn't give us an herb like this for it to be the devil's plant, what they say, and that's wrong. This is an angel's plant. This is, does good for human beings. It's never killed nobody in its entire existence. It's time that we quit uh, witch hunting this plant and you know we take it into our knowledge and do good like the fathers did. Bless this plant and let that plant teach us. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Irie Wednesday, featuring reggae, ska, and other world music genres. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. Boy, I tell you, with the weeks I've been having, I really need to get Irie, so i got to turn it over to the expert, my own Ginger Rasta, my good friend, Brian the Red here, from hey. Red Eyes Reggae Flashback. What's up, Brian? So, you know how the flashback is, you know, I've got a title track for each week, and it's one of the tracks in this, uh, the set that I play, you know, the hour set, that uh, I think that people should, you know, kind of pay more attention to. Uh, so, this is... Uh, Truth, fact, and correct with uh, Babylon de Pon Fire. So you know, enjoy. Let it burn. <laughs> I'm 
<laughs> I love marijuana. I do. It makes me a better parent. Right? Because I don't hit my kids. I'll talk to them three or four hours. They probably wish I would hit them. Jesus, Dad, you're still talking. Can I get a spanking? Is that cool? Violence won't teach you anything, man. We gotta get to the bottom of it. <laughs> My kids know I smoke weed. They don't care. They know when they smell weed, we're going for miniature golf like 20 minutes. So, <laughs> find your shoes. They know that thanks to the beauty of marijuana, dad will take them to any fucking animated feature ever. <laughs> what? The panda knows kung fu? Shit, get in the car! <laughs> Watch for cars, look out! About drugs. You? Or some guy? When your kids find out you've been lying to them about marijuana, who will they trust? Let's have a rational discussion about drug reform. Let's tax and regulate marijuana restrict youth access, and create safer communities. It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. All right, welcome back, everybody. Half past on a Wednesday, and you know that means it's time to get your medicine. With Dr. Mitch Earlywine, medicine of knowledge here to help fight for the end of adult marijuana prohibition. Dr. Mitch, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. All right. We got all sorts of stuff that's stacked up since uh, we've been away for a while. And I uh, want to remind folks, we'll take questions in our chat room uh, at uh, at Ustream. You can also call us live at 971-533-7111. We always let Dr. Mitch open the segment, though, with whatever's the latest in cannabis science. Well, Russ, as you saw, there's a uh, alleged mental illness linked to heavy cannabis use article that came out relatively recently. And I just want folks to be careful when they interpret this because there's a lot of self-medication going on with cannabis. A lot of folks who may have some mental illness symptoms turn to cannabis before they're diagnosed, and then that tends to boost this idea that somehow cannabis is a source of mental illness. Right, right. It's the old chicken and egg phenomenon. These guys have uh, demons in their head, and they're trying to take care of them by you know, maybe smoking a little herb, and that gets confused with causation. Exactly. So just because something comes first doesn't mean it's necessarily the cause. And in fact, when you look closely at some of these data, it's uh, often not even clear that the cannabis use came before the symptoms. Hmm. Okay. So it, it seems to me we get this this same a variation on this theme every six months or so, uh, like a wave. Uh, is this them just trying to find harms for cannabis to justify the the continuing prohibition? As odd as it seems, this actually goes back to the 1890s. Hmm. For some reason, people have always thought cannabis is a cause of mental illness. But again, we, we've got self-medication going on for literally 100 years. I, I think the clincher here, too, is there may be a subset of folks who are at risk for some psychotic disorders. And if they use cannabis heavily early in life, they may be more likely to develop those disorders a little earlier than they would if they hadn't. Mm. We've talked before about how cannabis use really isn't for teens. It's not for adolescents. But again, the idea that cannabis is somehow causal in all forms of mental illness is just a big exaggeration. All right. There's, there's a couple other studies I want to get to, but we've got questions coming in on the chat room. And, and this one I think is really good because it's, uh, it fits with a story we told earlier in our news segment about the Czech uh, Republic and their pharmacies now that are allowed to sell medical marijuana. And Runaround666 wants to know uh, he, he, that the Czech Republic 
has psoriasis as one of the qualifying conditions. And we've not seen that listed anywhere here in America. So what are your thoughts on a psoriasis and medical cannabis use? The curious thing is skin conditions were actually originally uh, a recommended uh, thing for cannabis going back uh, at least to uh, ancient Roman times. So, I mean, we're talking literally hundreds of years. There's a general drying of mucous membranes that cannabis is notorious for, and the idea that it would uh, dry skin and help uh, essentially uh, correct the symptoms increase is not inconceivable. Obviously, there aren't randomized clinical trials on this, but I'd actually love to see uh, one of these happen. Psoriasis is an easy thing to kind of minimize, but in fact, folks who have it, uh, you know, severely tend to find that uh, anything that can relieve their symptoms can be a huge help just to uh, daily functioning. Yeah, I, I have two people in my life, a really good friend and the girl who works down at the convenience store, both who battle uh, psoriasis. And uh, unfortunately, the girl that works at the convenience store is drug tested. So we she has tried. We gave her some of the cannabis salve and she's tried it and she thought it was remarkable. But she was so afraid to do it anymore uh, that that she's back to just using uh, the conventional therapies, which uh, are not having much effect. And what makes me sad about that is what would she really mess up at the convenience store? <laughs> is she going to put the candy bars in with the ice cream? I mean, is it really this <laughs> outrageous horror if she were using medical cannabis? Yeah, exactly. And, um, well, let's get to uh, another one of the studies that I had uh, pulled up. This one I saw coming out of Medscape, uh, and it was a... It was, a, uh, it was originally published online in Diabetes Care, and it was uh, the, the lead on this is chronic cannabis smoking induces subtle metabolic changes that include increased visceral adiposity and adipose tissue insulin resistance. Uh, and reading a little further down in it, it just talks about basically how it seems pot smokers get more belly fat, which um, I guess I can attest to. I have to admit it's a little disappointing. We have seen cannabis-related slowing in metabolism from Fulton's work all the way back in the 80s. That slowed metabolism and increased food consumption is bound to turn into some adiposity somewhere. It looks like uh, that little fat around the belly seems to be the way it goes. It's, it's sad to think that a beer cut could also be a cannabis gut, but at least these data are consistent with that. I'd like to see something like this replicated, though, because I feel like they ran a whole lot of statistical tests in this data set and that this may have just been uh, type 1 error, just something that came out as a fluke for all the different stats they happen to run. So I don't want to make too much of this yet. Is this uh, also possible, you know, looking through this, it says they had um, 30 cannabis smokers uh, matched with 30 controls. So, I mean, is, is 60, you know, a large enough number to make much out of? The funny thing is, is usually when you have a sample that small, it's a big effect that's getting detected statistically. But uh, again, we don't have a huge difference here. We're not talking about pounds and pounds. They measure the uh, the uh, fat in the stomach using these MRIs. They're not perfectly reliable, but they're definitely something going on there. But yeah, as you mentioned, with a sample this small, we really do need to see a replication. There was other evidence in here um, that was interesting. The second paragraph says, there is no evidence, however, of an association between chronic cannabis smoking and more severe metabolic impairment, no hepatic steatosis, insulin insensitivity, impaired pancreatic function, or glucose intolerance. So with respect to people who might be pre-diabetic or worried about diabetes, what does this tell us? In truth, the, my concern is always that uh, cannabis does enhance appetite, and we just want to make sure anybody who's using it has a nice lean protein source around and doesn't turn to the Twinkies. But even if, uh, even if you do, it's not as if you're going to be suddenly insensitive to insulin as a result of cannabis use alone. Okay. Another question from our chat room. Uh, James Seatown wants to know, what type of research will we see in Washington and Colorado now that it's legal there, considering that it's still illegal under federal law? Well, I have to admit, I envy those guys. Um, so if they're not applying for federal funding for their research, their institutional review boards and ethics boards for research will probably loosen up on the idea of administering cannabis in the laboratory and give them the chance to really ask all the questions we've all been dying to know for years and years. I'm imagining the more pragmatic things we'll have to do with cannabis and driving. We're already seeing small samples that uh, the impact of cannabis on driving is not what we had all feared. 
And I'm uh, also hoping to see some more medically oriented things, including some more data on cannabis and pain, and uh, ideally some some interesting studies on cannabis and creativity, which I know we've talked about in the past, but uh, we just don't have a big enough set of studies to really draw any neat conclusions about that yet. All right. Let's uh, go back to some studies that I were, was looking up. I, I found three here that I wanted to talk about. And I want to remind folks, too, you can get your questions in here by calling in 971-533-7111. Or you can get them into our chat room. We'll answer them that way. Or if you just want to keep it private and, and talk to Dr. Mitch directly, you can do it through our contact page at 420radio.org. There's a drop-down list there, and there'll be a line for Ask Dr. Mitch, and that'll send it to his email at 420research at gmail.com. So uh, there are lots of ways to get the information you need. But this uh, story comes from uh, theweedblog.com, and the uh, headline is, Cannabis Smoking Associated with Significantly Better Health Outcomes Than Tobacco Smoking. This is from the Department of No Duh, but I just, uh, this is a study out of uh, University of New South Wales, uh, relationship between cannabis tobacco and combined cannabis tobacco use. It looks to me like it's just confirming what we've you know said before on the show. Well, we've been relying on Tashkin's data so much when we talk about uh, pulmonary impacts of cannabis versus pulmonary impacts of tobacco, and it's really nice to have this confirmed in a separate study with a separate, separate sample. And I, I uh, you know, emphasize again that, you know, smoking may not be our first choice as far as cannabis consumption is concerned, but it does not seem to lead to the pulmonary problems that tobacco smoke leads to, despite an overlap in, in a whole bunch of different chemicals. THC, as we've mentioned before, does not uh, increase the probability of the generation of tumors, whereas nicotine, uh, unfortunately, really does. And so, uh, here's a chance to say not only is cannabis uh, better than tobacco, but in fact, uh, if you do choose to smoke cannabis, uh, even though there may be more harmless ways to use it, it's not a complete disaster. All right. Skeptic420 in our chat room wants to know, and this is the first time I've heard this question asked, does licorice interact with cannabis? Like, does it make your heart race? As it turns out, uh, th there is a, a, a chemical that used to be in licorice that no longer is in there that was uh, linked to an increase in heart rate, but you would have had to have eaten literally uh, like half a pound of it. Um, and I, I'm, I'm under the impression, at least, that they no longer use that chemical in the making. Uh, and, in fact, it was only in black licorice. It wasn't in red licorice, so I, I don't think it would be a big issue. Yeah, not for me because black licorice is evil and should never be eaten by anyone. <laughs> What's up is, with that? Well, is that a <laughs> is it a naturally occurring uh, licorice? So, so the 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 organic source, the some of the things that were uh, used to, to flavor black licorice back in the day, did have some mild uh, tachycardia effects. Mm -hmm. Would would increase heart rate. Uh, but we're talking, you know, years and years ago. Okay, we have a call coming in from the three one six area code. You're on the air with Doctor Mitch. What's your question? Yes, I was uh, recently diagnosed with uh, active tuberculosis, and uh, it's kind of one. And I've always smoked every day, all day. But I kind of wanted to know if there's any information about vaporizing the TB or lung damage or anything, really, about tuberculosis and smoking cannabis or vaporizing. Well, I'm really sorry to hear about this, and obviously uh, anything that you can do to keep your lungs healthy is going to be a, a big plus. Uh, big population studies done in South Africa tried to link cannabis to uh, basically tuberculosis stuff, but it's really not a clear, definite link. Obviously, if you can turn to edibles or vaporization, it's going to have to be uh, markedly better than uh, just you know pure smoking. Um, but it seems unlikely that cannabis would have been the source of this tubercular reaction, uh, just given the data that we have. Okay. I was just kind of also, you'd think it would be all right. I mean, I had it for so long that I don't have a left lung no more, and I got, I got to get it operated on, get the stuff cleaned out and closed up, and then I got a hole in the front of the tube. And I got my right lung, it collapsed, but it's like, it's getting better and better every day. And uh, I was just kind of afraid 
if it would be all right to vaporize. I'm talking like yeah, you're right. No, actually, with a with a collapsed lung, you really should only only turn to edibles under those circumstances. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Um, sure thing. And sorry to hear about this news. That's, that's really a, a drag. Yeah, thank you for your call. Uh, appreciate the call at uh, 971-533-7111. Uh, last question. Uh, oh, well, we've got two, one that just appeared, so we'll see if we can get them both in here. Uh, real quick, El Cap wanted to know, any problems using cannabis with SSRI antidepressants? I'm just I'm just not a big fan of SSRI antidepressants, and I'd prefer a behavioral intervention anyway. We haven't seen meaningful interactions between cannabis and the SSRIs. But in truth, the two-year follow-up data suggests that they're maybe 5% better than placebo. Uh, if you check out David Byrne's book, Feeling Good, or feel free to email me, and I'll send you some links to some books that can be as helpful, if not more so. All right. And finally, uh, we have a question. We've got uh, Big Daddy Fink wants to know, uh, Mom is be going, going to be starting chemo next week. She has type 2 diabetes and have just gotten her to vaporizing. Uh he has access to Rick Simpson oil. Can she use uh, these uh, edible oils, uh, infused oils, while doing chemo? We, we don't have any data either way, but it seems rather unlikely that they would have a negative effect. Um, again, as long as if she's got diabetes, you want to make sure you've got something good for her to eat around that's not just Twinkies. Um, but no, we don't. We don't have any data either way. There's no compelling reason to think that it would be a, a problem. All right. Well, that's all the time we've got here for our cannabis Q and A segment with Dr. Mitch Earlywine, and he appears here every Wednesday at half past the hour. So uh, get your questions ready, and uh, we'll get them answered here. Or you can go to our contact form and send your questions directly. Dr. Mitch, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it all you do. Thank you. When we come back, we've got Tracy Ansley from Moms for Marijuana, Texas. Stick around. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Normal stands for responsible adult cannabis use. If cannabis use is causing problems in your life, consider taking a break or seeking medical assistance. Consider ceasing cannabis use if you have a family history of mental illness. Don't drive or operate heavy machinery while impaired by cannabis use. Cannabis use is not without risks, even though the risks may be far less than those posed by legal drugs. Do you want to legalize it? Call your congressman today. 202-224-3121. It's free, it's easy, and you don't even have to give your name. Just your zip code, and they'll hook you up to your congressman. Call 202-224-3121 and tell Congress you support marijuana legalization. Liberate your mind. Liberate your mind. Liberate your mind. Activism begins with ACT. The Russ Belleville Show features the stories of hardworking, grassroots activists working for an end to prohibition in today's activist agenda. All right, folks, welcome back. It's 46 after the hour, and today we get the opportunity to talk with Tracy Ansley from Moms for Marijuana in Texas in a little segment we like to call Listen to Your Mother, which we all should do a little bit more of. Tracy, welcome to the show. Oh, boy, really? Hello, Tracy, are you there? <laughs> all right, let's try that again. Uh, we're going to take a quick little break and see what we can see. Oh, my goodness. I'll be right back. Hey, DJ, play the record. 
spin the break back to back, put my record on replay. We having fun a little, fucking with the fundamental, spit pun and riddles. Fat love's gonna get you. We do the ritual and keep it original. My audio, digital, visual, will get you in the mood. Where my jigger jig is at, it's your trigger finger cats. Murder the wax and hit a little with your Hello, Tracy. Hello, Russ. How are you? Hi there. Nice to get you on the line. We're speaking with Tracy Ansley from Moms for Marijuana. And uh, in Texas, where are you in Texas, my dear? I'm close to Rockwall. Okay. I don't know where that is. Where at? Sort of East Texas. Okay. All right. So uh, East Texas. And uh, how long have you been with Moms for Marijuana? Uh, A little over a year. Okay. So uh, what inspired you to get involved with the group called Moms for Marijuana? Well, Russ, I'm a nurse, and I have um, seen the harm that pharmaceuticals have done to my patients. Um, and I have a son with systemic lupus, mm. um, so it hit really close to home. I see. So is this, I, is this a, a therapy you've been able to use for your son for the lupus? Yes, we have. And how is this compared to, I, I imagine you've tried all sorts of things, how is this compared to other uh, medications? Um, it doesn't harm his liver. Does it take it, and, it helps the pain a bit? It does help the pain. You know, he has actually, um, been without, um, uh, his rheumatoid tests have been negative for over a year now. And this is just with juicing and, um, eating it. He doesn't actually, uh, smoke or vaporize. Hmm. He uses tinctures and juices it and eats it raw. We've been hearing a lot of, uh, you know, more reports of that, the raw juicing. Uh, Dr. William Courtney is a big proponent of this. Uh, how did you find out about the juicing? Um, the Internet, doing lots and lots of research. Yeah, I can't imagine that where you're at in Texas, there's not a whole lot of uh, local information on this. No, no, there's really not. Um, you know, there is a Texas Coalition for Compassionate Care, which is an advocacy group um, that only work, you know, it works... Uh, with medical patients, it tries to help medical patients however they can and lobby for the uh, the medical bill like H bill uh, House Bill five ninety four. So you've uh, been doing this advocacy now for a year with Moms for Marijuana. Uh, tell us what that's been like. I mean, have there been major changes to your life being out and open about this where you live? Um, you know, I found a lot of positive, um, yeah. and when I finally, you know, started telling people, you know, um, the way I felt, you know, that I had chose to use natural medication, um, I work with a lot of older people, and they're very open to it, yet our Texas legislators seem to think that they're not. Um, you know, these Republican legislators really feel like that they're, they will appear soft on drugs if they do anything like decriminalize a, um, an ounce or less and possibly, you know, allow a medical defense. And I really think they're underestimating our older voters mm. because um, I, I volunteer a lot with these people and I have found that they, you know, that they've lived long enough to see the difference between alcohol, prescription medication, and marijuana. Even though if they haven't used it themselves, they've been experience, exposed to people that do. Hmm. Yeah, very, very well put. And uh, Tracy, with the group Moms for Marijuana there in in Texas, how has the uh, how's the activism been going? Has you been building a lot of ch- a, a big network there, or more people coming out to support you? Yeah, I've actually started getting more support lately. Um, I was taking care of my stepdad, so I really wasn't able to do much. Um, he was on hospice, hmm. and I was able to use tincture with him. He had Alzheimer's and dementia. And the antipsychotic drugs that the um, doctors were giving him made him worse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then so I finally talked my mom into giving him censure. And um, he was better. They actually were able to have a loving relationship for about the last six months of his life. That's Whereas beautiful. he had been freaked out and combative at night for three years before this. Wow. And you know, when you see that with your own two eyes, it, it's so frustrating then when you have to go into, I guess in your case, Austin and, and talk to these lawmakers who haven't seen it with their own two eyes and trying to convince them that it's really medicine. And then they, they dismiss you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, is, it is hard. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to collect as many patient stories as I can 
and get more, you know, women, because it's the families that it's destroying. And, you know, the women are going to have to protect their families. Oh, I, I agree. And, and we saw, you know, if, you, if you're a student of history, you know, alcohol prohibition was firmly entrenched through the 1920s. And at the end of the 20s, 1929, Pauline Sabin and some other brave women stood up and said, we need to you know, end prohibition to save our children. And in four years, it was done. And I think with strong, right. strong women like you standing up and Moms for Marijuana and Normal Women's Alliance, all these women's groups are going to make the difference. I hope so. That is what we're trying to do. Well, speaking of making a difference, activism starts with ACT, and that's, you know, the whole pr- purpose of this segment. I understand you've got an event coming up really quick here uh, that we need to tell people about, so why don't you tell us about it? Okay. Um, this Saturday on the 6th, from 10 to 1, I am going to have the Cannabis Awareness Quilt and the Unity Quilt on the southwest lawn of the Capitol. We are going to have... Um, Noel Davis, who is a public policy consultant, speak. Elizabeth Rodriguez of DSW Normal and the Normal Women's Alliance. Speak. And I'm going to share a little bit about what I experienced um, at the hearing for House Bill 184 and lobbying with our legislators and then, um, you know, trying to, I've um, been working with the Texas Nurses Association to get us um, a statement of support from them. Excellent. That's and and the Unity Quilt. Uh, I I got to see it. I was down in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, last month and got to see it. And it's it's an it's a great display to have on the courthouse steps there as people are coming in to do their business. They can they, they it builds conversations. It makes people ask questions. Uh, I'm really glad that you guys are are a part of that. So again, it's this Saturday. Give us the uh, location and times again. It's the Southwest Lawn of the Capitol. And we're going to be there from 10 to 1. They said we could stay later if we ran later. Um, and we are going to have a little bit of music, of, you know, just a little, uh, some guest speaking. Um, and then uh, we're going to read It's Just a Plant and have a family picnic. It's Just a Plant, well, yeah, we're, we're doing this. Um, yeah, the, the children's book, right. It's Just a Plant. Gotcha. Right. Now, I'm, I'm checking out our live chat room right now, and, and the word I keep seeing pop up over and over again from people discussing what we're talking about here is courageous, brave. How can you not be scared for losing your job or your children to be in a state like Texas and be so open like this? What would you tell them? Um, I am a little nervous about it, mm-hmm. but um, we've, got to, we've got to speak up. It, you know, it, it's become ridiculous. We have to, you know, we have to speak up. Um, I hope that I'm not going to lose my kids over it. Um, my son is 21. I do have an almost 17, I mean, an almost seven-year-old daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it is scary. But it, but the damage that I have seen pharmaceuticals done in my nursing career of almost 25 years now, it far outweighs the fear that I have. You know, the anger that I have, the, that we're poisoning generations of people when there's a safer alternative out there. Mm. Yes. And, you know, working in nursing like you do, of course, you're going to get the, the front row seat to seeing all the, the liver damage and kidney damage and even mental health trauma that goes through some of the people that are using these uh, these pharmaceuticals and we have got the, we've got this natural non-toxic herb that can help in so many ways and even you know uh we've seen reports coming out of California where you know there are some people whose pain for example is going to be so devastating they have to be on an opioid or so, of some kind but when they combine right. cannabis with it they don't have to use as much they don't have to use as much they don't so you say your oldest son is 21. You've got a daughter who's seven. No, actually, I have an older son who's almost 27, and he's a Dallas police officer, and he supports what I do. Really? That Now, does, really? he, does he tell you much about, I mean, other police officers he works with, or is that just his own? No, this is just his own opinion. He hmm. actually has, I don't know how much he's discussed with other officers at this point. Right, right. It'd be kind of hard to, I imagine, uh, talk much about it, but... At least we know that there's one Dallas police officer who's got the right view on this, right? Right, that's right. <laughs> now, as far as your daughter, you say she's seven? She's seven, yes. Uh, one of the things, when I talk to parents about this subject, they we often have to talk about how your kid will know the truth, but you have to tell them not to tell the truth to everyone else all the time. Has right. that been the case for you? Well, I make sure that I don't put her in a situation where she has to lie. Mm-hmm. 
you know, um, I don't consume around her. You know, I use tincture, but that's like normal medicine. You know, I I don't. It's um, and I explain to her. I explain to my my boys that um, about recreational use also, and that you know I feel very strongly um, that if you feel like you need to be uh, to get altered, that it should be done with cannabis and not alcohol. It's much safer. Mm. You know, I I would hope that they don't ever feel like they need to recreate, but I you know. Yeah. That, well, you're arming them. With, do, then so be it. You that's know? right. You're, you're arming them with the honest uh, facts about that, and I think that's the best thing a parent can do. Tracy Ansley from Moms for Marijuana in Texas. Before we let you go, uh, do you have Facebook or Twitter or email or website or any of that stuff you need to tell people about? Okay, it's um, Dallas Moms for Marijuana on Facebook and Texas Moms for Marijuana on Facebook. And I'm Tracy Ansley at momsformarijuana.org if you want to email me. All right. Tracy. I'd like to see more of the people from DFW get active. We've actually got a, a small band of women going to Austin this weekend. And you know, we're looking forward to doing some things. We're going to um, tie-dye some shirts and send them to Jared Allway with Safer. Oh, good. Well, Tracy, I appreciate all the hard work you're doing out there in Texas and, of course, all the moms for marijuana. And uh, it's great to get you on the air finally. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. That's all the time we got for Hour 1 here. But stay tuned for Toker Talk Radio in Hour 2. We'll take your calls at 971-533-7111 if you've got any questions. In Hour 2, we got a, a really good, an awesome headline that Ryan the Red brought to me yesterday. This story's got everything. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. Take a seat, you're planning, you're growing, you're giant, you're on it, you're smoking. You take a seat, you're planning, you're growing, you're giant, you're on it, you're smoking. Take a seat, you're